Hi, hi, Paul. And uh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you to the organizers for the invitation. And uh, I'm led to, to sort of the audience. So, in the next um, an hour, I'd like to give you a sort of informal lecture about quantum computers and the optical application of quantum computers. Okay, let me start with uh, my eyes. The world is quantum. So, at the microscopic lens scale, where the physical systems are molecules, atoms, electrons, elementary particles, and so on, we have that uh, the classical mechanism. So, there is a new theory, for, you know, uh, that uh, for describing a microscopic system, we, we, we need quantum mechanics. Okay, and uh, quantum things, so quantum features of a physical, of quantum physical system are sort of zero states. So, for example, uh, the question is, is the electron either here or there, and uh, in both places, at least before a measurement process? So, and this is not a naive interpretation. And the common interpretation of the scientists is that is the a fundamental property of reality. And uh, another important thing is that observations alter the state of certain systems. And in this sense, when we observe the electron, the state of the electron collapses in the state here or there. And uh, according to some probability that uh, with the theory, the quantum mechanics, we can uh, estimate these probabilities with mathematics. And uh, we have also a nice uh, guide with entanglements. It's a kind of non-classical correlation between quantum systems. It's a, okay, I, I cannot give you uh, at least uh, in this story, but after the talk, we can uh, we can improve our our discussion, and uh, the, it can become as as much technical as we want. Uh, and uh, so, the, the entanglement was called by Einstein spooky at distance because we have this non-local uh, phenomenon in quantum mechanics, apparently contradiction with Einstein's locality provided by theory of relativity. Okay, so using physical phenomena to process information is a good and old idea. Charles Babbage, Anna Lovelace, and so on, Alan Turing. But uh, what if are we able to use quantum phenomena? And this is the, the, the topic of, uh, of the talk. Okay, a bit of history. So quantum information and quantum computing, we can, historically, historically speaking, the birth is of the first uh, conference of physics computation where Feynman proposed a quantum computer as a quantum simulator. So, quantum systems and physical systems are uh, hard to classically to be classically simulated, and so we need a quantum machine in order to simulate a quantum system and study because simulations are are a useful tool in physics in order to study physical systems. And uh, a few years later. We have the first uh, theoretical proposal of a quantum computer in terms of a quantum Turing machine as a sort of quantum generalization of uh, the universal computation model provided by Turing in the sense of classical computation. Then we have in the middle of the 90s, we have the proposals of the well known short algorithm that is an algorithm designed for a universal quantum computer. And with the short algorithm, we are we we would be able to factorize a large integer into prime factors in polynomial time. And here we have, uh, at least on a theoretical level, uh, an industrial aftermath uh, in terms of uh, the breaking of RSA cryptography. And this is near to the topic of the next talk. And RSA cryptography is the, probably the most used public key cryptography uh, right now. And uh, the, 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 the other well-known algorithm is the Grover, that is uh, a search of, uh, uh, if you want to, to perform a search in a stacker database, uh, okay, classically you have uh, to, to, do an, uh, to make an exhaustive search of your list, where there is no function. But uh, with a quantum encoding, so encoding uh, the information into quantum states or quantum systems, or microscopic systems, you can uh, operate, you can perform operations, quantum operations, and you can find your item 
um, of the search uh, in, with a quadratic speed up in time with respect to the exhaustive search provided by the classical computation. Okay, and in the last 20 years, more or less, we have uh, the first prototypes of quantum computers. And uh, in the last decade, basically, from uh, since uh, 2010, we had uh, quantum computers on the market, for example, the way that IBM Pure System 1. Okay, um, are we able to solve hard problems with quantum computers that are untractable with quantum machines? No, we don't. Not yet. But uh, the, the point uh, is, uh, is uh, to, to study in this sense in order to push forward the knowledge line of the computing. So the present days, uh, this is the situation. Okay, so we have uh, we have some industries that are very interested in solving real life problems with quantum computers or starting to study new strategies to use quantum machines in order to solve real life problems with industrial aftermath, for example. And uh, but we are in the so-called NISC era, and uh, where we have uh, these uh, machines with uh, uh, low numbers of qubits, for example, for the proto prototypes of the universal quantum computer, we have more or less uh, 100 qubits, but we have uh, uh, no protection against noise, basically. And uh, we have, uh, so, we, there are no um, universal quantum, quantum machines available right now in this sense. So the hot topics, in the present days, is uh, the so-called quantum optimization. So, specific purpose quantum machines uh, designed to solve uh, by means of quantum phenomena optimization problems, and uh, quantum machine learning. That is uh, uh, our uh, the, the main topic of this. So, let me just stress that uh, quantum computer exists. Here we have to celebrate examples. Uh, the quantum annealer. Uh, manufactured by D-Wave. This is not a universal quantum computer, it's a so-called quantum manier, a specific purpose uh, computer to solve quadratic optimization problem. And here we have the prototypes of a universal quantum computer by IBM. Okay, here, so the quantum processor is basically here, and this system is, is the refrigerator to achieve the, the, the cryogenic temperature to, to in order to enable the, the, the superconductive phenomena uh, in the quantum processor, where the qubits are realized by superconducting circuits. Okay, so um, the, the beating block, uh, for at least from the, the viewpoint of the theory, is uh, in quantum information, quantum computing, is the quantum bit, the so-called qubit. And uh, okay, in the classical case, we know that a bit is an object which uh, states, 0 and 1, for example, denoted by 0 and 1. And uh, in the case of uh, quantum computing, where a qubit is realized by uh, two level quantum systems, where superpositions of states are available as a fundamental property of quantum mechanics and quantum physics, we have that uh, the state of a quantum bit, the states of a quantum bit are in bijective correspondence can be represented by the points of the surface of this sphere, called block sphere. Example, physical example of qubits are half spin particles, chloride photon, uh, controlled superconducting circuit, and so on, for example, the in the previous slides are based on the superconducting circuit. Okay, a bit of mathematics. Okay, the rest of the talk is a lecture of mathematics. Okay, well, I'm joking. <laughs> scared. Okay, so um, the, basically we describe the, the, the qubits by means of uh, complex vector space. So the state of, uh, of a qubit is a superposition of two states that are so fundamental state states, or a fundamental is on the right. The, the, the two are based on a couple of states, okay? And uh, the, 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 states, the, the general state of the qubits is a superposition of zero and one, in, this, in the sense that we have visualized in the block sphere in the previous time. And a measuring process affects the qubits. When you measure a qubit, you obtain the outcome zero one. So the readout of uh, 
from a qubit, when you extract uh, information from a qubit, uh, you have the, 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 the output of the measurement is again either 0 or 1, like in the classical case, but according to a probability that are related to in the complex coefficients of the quantum superposition. And after the measurements, uh, the, 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 the state collapses in one of the two eigenstates. That's these two uh, elements, these two states are called eigenstates, technically. Okay, I, this is a disclaimer for mathematicians. Okay. And uh, okay, just uh, if you consider two qubits, you have uh, each qubit is described in this two dimensional space, and uh, the, 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 the space, the vector space, where you describe a qubit pair is given by the tensor product of, uh, of the two subspaces, and you obtain in this case a, a C4. But if you take n qubits, you have that you have to describe the states of a collection of n qubit, a n qubit register, in a space whose dimension is exponential in a number of qubits. And this is the mathematical reason why in quantum computing we have an exponential real capacity of data. Exponential in number of qubits. Exponential in our space resources. Okay, so I close the mathematical parenthesis. Okay, so we are in front of a new kind of information. We have an empirical evidence motivated by several experimental results uh, and this is the situation is quite complicated. But uh, trust me, we have the empirical evidence motivating the most common interpretation in the community of physicists that uh, the, the quantum randomness due to the probability we, of the outcomes when we measure a, a qubit or a quantum system in general the states of that position, the entanglement, are physical phenomena, not uh, interpretation of our theory related to the mathematical description of the nature, but uh, are meant as uh, fundamental properties of the nature itself. Okay, so uh, in this perspective, if we are able to encode information to qubits, or more general quantum objects, quantum systems, allows completely new kind of information storing and processing, data representation, telecommunication, cyber security, but in particular, we are interested in the, the possibilities in much general. Where we have machines encode the data, classical data, into the state of quantum uh, systems, for example, the qubits, and are able to operate uh, on these qubit registers in order to have computation. So, in quantum computing we have the quantum version of the logical gates of digital computing that are the so-called quantum gates. So we have our pair of single qubits of these two states, 0 and 1, where all the states of the two are position, 0 and 1. And we have the Hamma gate, so this is the definition of Given Però, is uh, written in, into this uh, symbol, in this stage by this is called cat in physics, in general physics. So if you take a cat one or, or cat zero, one of the two eigenstates of the qubits, so this is a quantum operation because uh, the, 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 the value of this qubit is transformed in the superposition zero one. one. So in this sense, uh, we have no uh, classical counterpart of the Hadamard gate. It's a uh, purely quantum transformation. We have also the phase gate acting in this way on the combination of the values of the qubits. Uh, uh, again, it, it's uh, another quantum transformation without a classical version, classical counterpart, because it's acting on the superposition of zero one, and we have the. the the quantum, the quantum control knot. This is the quantum version of the classical C knot, but of course, uh, this is the definition on the basis elements, but the action on the, on the general qubit states is uh, generalized from this definition. So it's extended by linearity 
using a mathematical language. Okay, the, the interesting thing is that the list of our quantum gates is finished here. Because we have this nice universality theorem, we have that uh, this trifold uh, of quantum gates is universal to quantum computation. So any quantum operation that can be performed by a universal quantum computer, universal in the sense of a Turing quantum machine, can be obtained combining these three quantum gates into quantum circuits, the so-called quantum circuits. <clears throat> in this sense, we have a notion of a complexity and so on. Okay, but the point is for us tonight, machine learning with quantum computers. What can we do? Okay, we have a list uh, of the main achievements from the theoretical viewpoint of, um, in, of quantum machine learning algorithm, basically since 2030. Okay, we have a list of well-known machine learning algorithms and uh, using the quantum encoding, so in, uh, the encoding of classical data into quantum states, and quantum operations, so acting with quantum circuits that are the combination of the three gates uh, that we have seen before, we can achieve this quantum speed up with respect to the classical counterparts. Theoretical results, theoretical results. Okay, I stress theoretical. So, we, uh, let me give a general observation. So quantum architectures enable new paradigms of data representation information processing with the possibility of achieving these quantum speedups. But these speedups are achieved with universal quantum machines beyond the NISC era. So with the available quantum machines, we are not able, unfortunately, not yet, to, to run this quantum machine learning algorithm achieving these speedups with respect to the classical counterparts. And in my opinion, <coughs> the current challenge in quantum computing, in particular in quantum machine learning, is the development of a quantum machine learning mechanism or quantum learning mechanism for av available or near-term quantum machines. So we have this NISC, noise intermediate scale quantum machine, and uh <coughs> sorry, we want to, to propose, we want to develop or devise learning, in general, learning mechanisms. So beyond uh, the translation of uh, classical algorithms uh, into quantum algorithms with a one-to-one -one correspondence like in this table here. But uh, we are in front of a completely new kind of information encoding and processing. So we, we need to discover completely new learning mechanism for quantum machines. Okay, le just an example. This is n let us consider quantum binary classifier. So we can uh, consider this classification model, a very, very general statement of a classification model. So assume data represented in a feature space. Okay, great. great. The model that we can consider assign a binary label to a new data instance evaluated is similar to any training point. So any training point is considered uh, and compared with uh, the, the, the test point, and we have to classify the unseen instance to the right class. Okay, so we have a possible quantum implementation on the, I, and uh, we, have, uh, we have run the, 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 the quantum classifier in a prototype version on a small IBM quantum processor, the IBM uh, Q Melbourne with seven qubits. So it's a proof of concept, completely proof of concept. Where the, quant the, where the training vectors can be represented in the state of a qubits, and we can prepare, we can initialize the quantum registers in the quantum machine in a superposition of training vectors. And we can also represent the test instance that we want to classify, that we need to classify in a superposition of the two classes. So, and in this uh, situation of superpositions, we can evaluate, we can compare the test, insta the test instance to the old training points by 
quantum parallelism, because uh, the quantum operation implemented in terms of quantum gates acts linearly into the superposition of quantum states. And in this sense, uh, you have a superposition, you act with a quantum circuit, and uh, in, you, you have, a, 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 as a result, a quantum parallelism. And in this sense, uh, we have a, uh, this, uh, this model, this simple model can be, or is, uh, is implemented in a classical machine with a classical complexity that is linear in the product of, this is the N, capital N is the number of, uh, of uh, training instances, D is uh, the dimension of the feature space, this is the size of the problem, and in this sense, we have uh, 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 an exponential speed up. Again, is a theoretical result. Okay, we have uh, um, a, a, a prototype on a very, very small quantum computer, but from the theoretical viewpoint, we, has, we, we have this uh, exponential quantum speed up. Here, if you want to take a picture of this light, we have some literature about uh, quantum machine learning scheme designed for universal quantum computers. So here we, ha we are within the theory, basically. Again, large-scale universal quantum computers do not exist right now. And here, okay, and here we, we have um, quantum version of the physics clustering, PCA, the, the quantum support vector machines, uh, we have the, the, the quantum version of the perceptron and the attempt to construct fit for, for example, fit for neural networks in terms of the quantum perceptrons and so on. And we have, in, in, in the last part of, of this lecture, I'd like to introduce uh, the notion of quantum annealing. And here we are not in the realm of a universal quantum computation. And uh, there is not the gate model to describe this kind of computation. It's a sort of, so uh, the quantum gates is the formulation of digital quantum computing. And here we have a sort of analog quantum computing. And so the quantum annealers are an hardware that is physically given by a quantum spin glass. And we have the collection of qubits represented by the vertices of a graph, and the, 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 the connections of the graph are the couplings among the qubits. And uh, the point is that, uh, for example, this is uh, the, 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 um, the so-called uh, chimera topology, uh, uh, hardware architecture of the D-Wave machine, not, not uh, the, 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 the most recent one. Okay, so the annealing process, so the, the, the quantum operations that is important in quantum annealing is the so-called annealing process. And it is an evolution of the duration more or less 20 microseconds. And here by energy dissipation, the quantum system evolves in the ground state, that is the less energetical uh, state of the system, that corresponds to the solution of a given optimization problem. So we have this the solution landscape that uh, we represent by the energy of the hardware architecture of the quantum annealer, and uh, the global minimum is the solution of our problem. So it's basically the, the, the formulation of optimization problem. And classically, we have to explore the solution landscape, for example, by simulated annealing, simulating the thermal vibration of, of a physical or a classical physical system, and if you if you are in a local minimum, you have to explore the neighbor, uh, the, the neighborhood, in order to jump the, the the hill, hoping to 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 end your evolution in the global minimum, in the global minimum. But by means of a quantum effect, that is the quantum tunneling, the tunnel effect, the um, the evolution, the dynamics of the quantum systems. Uh, achieves efficiently the global minimum in your solution landscape. The price is that you must be able to encode a given problem into the energy of that quantum hardware. So we have a shortcoming in this sense. So representing a given problem, for example, an optimization problem, a quadratic optimization problem, if we have the architecture of the chimera topology, into the quantum hardware is difficult in general. 
and can destroy the efficiency of the quantum computation, of course. Because if you, if you need a year, one year, to encode a given problem into the, into, the, into the quantum machines, okay, the quantum computation is very, very fast, very efficient. But if you have a, 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 a huge, expensive uh, classical preprocessing, the quantum advantage is basically destroyed. So a proposed solution by, by me and collaborators here in Trento is that um, it is called quantum annealing learning search. So it's a, an hybrid algorithm where the, the quantum machines is, uh, is coupled with a, with a classical architecture and within an iterative uh, structure where there is the implementation of a taboo search, maybe uh, someone of you is familiar with the taboo, the classical taboo search. And we have, we are able to provide this algorithm enabling a learning mechanism into, into the quantum machines that, uh, that learns the representation of the given problem into its own architecture without the, 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 the classical preprocessing by the human user that, uh, that is uh, required uh, for, for the representation of the given problem into, into the, the quantum architecture. Okay, so we can, uh, this here, uh, some literature about machine learning with quantum annealers. In particular, the, these quantum spin glasses can be used to implement a Boltzmann machine with uh, some interesting quantum advantages, not in terms of time complexity, so no quantum speed up, but in terms of uh, the efficiency, or in terms of the quality of uh, the generated distribution. Boltzmann machine is a, ge a generative model. And uh, a quantum uh, Boltzmann machine is able of generating better distribution, probability distributions. Okay, and uh, let me conclude, basically, the... How much time do I have? One hour. Five minutes, okay. Thank you, thank you. Okay, the last five minutes, uh, what about quantum neural networks? Okay, in the, in the table with the quantum speed ups, th there was a question mark in the quantum speed up of uh, quantum neural networks. Because the, the, there is no theoretical results uh, establishing the, 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 a quantum advantage in terms of time complexity of quantum neural networks. And also the notion of quantum neural networks is some way, somehow vague. In this sense, uh, in most literature, the a feed forward quantum neural networks is not a combination of perceptrons in layers, for example, but is a parametric quantum circuit. So it's a quantum circuit, a combination of quantum gates, where the quantum gates are parametrized. The parameters are the parameter of the are so are seen as parameters of the network that so a, a a circuit of this form is trained by backpropagation like a classical neural network, so like, uh, like the, feed, the classical feed-forward neural networks. But if you, if you consider a, a parametric circuit like this, where you have uh, only single qubit rotations, so here you have uh, uh, your qubit register of n qubits, for example, initially prepared in the state uh, cat0, cat zero, any qubits is prepared at the beginning in the state cat zero, and you have a single qubit gate acting on any qubit, given by a rotation in the sphere that we, where we have represented the states of a single qubit at the beginning. So here, there are independent transformation on the register, and the qubits are coupled by means of the, these C naught gates here, entangling the, the, the qubits of the register. Okay, considering uh, an, an architecture of this form, in this uh, walk, we have that uh, a quantum neural network of this form achieves higher values of effective dimension. Effective dimension is a figure of merit. 
that is a sort of measure of a volume of a statistical model within the space of parameters and is a way to quantify the generalization capability of a statistical model, of a parametric statistical model. And uh, by a comparison with a classical feed forward neural network with the same number of parameters, we have that they, they, they prove, also empirically, that uh, the quantum version entangling the qubit. So in this uh, sequence of C0 gates, we have the non-classical correlation of the qubits. This is the non-classical behavior that we want to study in order to achieve an advantage with respect to classical machines. And uh, the author of this paper identify the quantum advantage with respect to the classical machine in the case of a feed forward neural networks in this sense, achieving a better effect, a higher effective dimension. So a more generalization power of the model implemented by means of a quantum circuit. Some concluding remarks of uh, this uh, short talk. Okay, uh, we have that in general, quantum architectures enables new kind of data process, completely new kind. Okay, we can use quantum machine to translate well-known classical algorithms in sort of quantum versions, but uh, the possibilities offered by quantum computing are beyond this kind of translation. We are in front of a completely new kind of uh, quantum information coding and processing. Okay, there is a bottleneck about the efficient data representation of quantum hardware, and this is one of the most uh, hard and interesting problem in quantum computing. For example, uh, the, the most quantum machine learning algorithm, the speed up of the most quantum machine learning algorithm designed for universal quantum computer, uh, are due to the assumption of the availability of a quantum RAM, the quantum version of a random access memory. And uh, our QRAM are not feasible yet. Okay, the era of quantum machine learning is just started, but uh, it's probably, and uh, I think so, it's uh, the most promising road for putting for the frontiers of quantum computing. Because they approach the I call it a, the industrial approach that is given a problem and we need to solve this problem. Well, find a quantum algorithms that, that efficiently solve my problem. This approach is completely wrong in quantum computing. But it's not uh, an abstract idea, it's the experience that uh, uh, teach us uh, th this, uh, this, um, this mechanism. Because in the last uh, 30 years, the most popular algorithms are Grover and Shor. Uh, in the last 30 years, thousands of researchers, of very talented researchers in the field of quantum computing, were not able to provide new quantum algorithms. So in this sense, uh, the, the, the learning mechanism is uh, the point, the crucial point in my, in my, in my viewpoint. Uh, that, uh, that is important to push forward the frontiers of quantum computing. Not simply we have a problem, find an algorithm to solve this problem. This is not possible in quantum computer. It's a limit of a human brain, for example. I don't know. But it's not possible. I think so. So the quantum classic hybrid approach is the best way to use the existing quantum machines. So the, the, the aim of quantum computing is not the disposal of classical machines. Classical machines are very, very useful tools, and uh, probably the destiny of quantum machines uh, is the interaction of quantum arch of classical architecture, of course. Again, providing efficient quantum algorithm algorithms is a very difficult task. So in this sense, uh, we have to devise a learning mechanism of new quantum algorithms toward a quantum meta-learning. I think this is the, the, the right road to, to, to follow. In other words, quantum computers must learn how to solve problems on their own. 
So we don't, we have not to devise quantum algorithms to solve problems, but we have to study to devise learning mechanism such a way quantum machines find their own quantum algorithms. Okay, I think that this is the, the, the concluding comments of this uh, informal, informal talk. And uh, thank you very much for your attention and patience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Hello, hello. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thanks a lot, Davide. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, I think I can say for everyone else, it was tough. <laughs> but uh, thanks, it was, thanks for, your, for your clarity. Okay, we have a few questions from, from the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, probably not going to ask them all. Uh, if your question does not get asked, you can always uh, ask directly later. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, start with an easy one, just right out of the way. Any good news about the LK99 superconductive material, or it was just hype? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> okay, uh, uh, um, okay. Um, the, I think that uh, just an hype is uh, to is a very very severe. Mm, uh, viewpoints, okay, and uh, I, I, I don't, uh, I don't want to give uh, this hard, hard, um, uh, my two cents in this sense. But uh, so, I think that probably now, from the point of view of hardware and the hardware development, is not my main interest because I'm, a, <laughs> I am a mathematician. <laughs> Okay, but I think that uh, right now it is the, the, the most uh, promising for working on the, uh, the NISC era. Okay, so. All right. Uh, okay, a small clarification. What, what do you mean when you say quadratic speed up of search algorithm? Is it like from O of n to O of square root of n or something different? Yes, of course. Okay. Yes, this is exactly the, the definition of the quadratic speed up of the search. Yeah. Perfect. It's a query. Uh, it's a query complexity. Mm -hmm. okay. Big O of square root of n instead of big O n. Okay. okay. So uh, yeah, <laughs> our audience is smart. Yeah. Uh, can you provide a more precise description of the difference between a universal quantum computer and the ones being currently built? Okay. Uh, so a universal quantum computer I is a machine that is able to implement uh, any quantum operation uh, in a fault tolerant way let's say. So, and uh, are the existing machine able to achieve this goal? No, no, they don't. So in this sense, we have not existing machines that are universal in, in this sense. So uh, th they are not able to implement any quantum operation. So they are not equivalent to a quantum Turing machine and are basically noisy. And th th the presence of noise uh, alterates the, the universality of course, of the of the computation. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's quite clear. Uh, how long do you think it will take, if ever, for there to be an entire master program about uh, only about quantum computing, university master program? But the the the, the, the question is, what uh, do I think about uh, an entire master program? Do Do you think it will ever exist? And if yes, uh, how long it will take? I, I don't know if uh, th there exists uh, right now uh, a, a, an entire program. So, uh, <laughs> Would it make sense uh, even? Ma <laughs> <laughs> Ma okay, <laughs> yes and no. O okay, it makes sense because I it's a, 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 an increasing f field uh, very, uh, very fastly, but, uh, but uh, uh, in my experience, my research experience, uh, the, the, um, the, 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 the strength of, uh, of, the, the, of quantum computing is the interactions between mathematicians, physicists, computer scientists, engineers. So I think that uh, in uh, each of these uh, areas, uh, there should be a, a program, a master program that is uh, particularly focused towards quantum computing, something like that. Mm, okay, all right. 
last question, I think. Will, will back propagation play a role in quantum machine learning? Can we hope for a better quantum based alternative? Uh, I think that uh, it's one uh, of uh, the, the, the most important goal of uh, the current research of quantum machine learning is devising completely new method of training uh, of uh, quantum networks uh, and uh, in general quantum models. So hopefully yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot uh, again. For Thank the you talk. to you. And uh, yeah, big applause. Thank you very much. Uh, without any break, we are ready for the second speaker of tonight. A warm applause for Nicolo Leone. Hey. Okay, thank you everyone for uh, this good uh, welcome and thank you the organizer for having invited me. I'm uh, Nicolo Leone, I'm also a physicist, but I try to be a little, more, a little less uh, tough in this talk and I want to present to you some of the drawbacks uh, or having uh, an universal quantum computer. And in particular, I want to focus on privacy. Because uh, in a sense we are seeing in the previous talk and also the uh, hype is quite high that uh, quantum computers are great can solve a lot of problems that are impossible to solve with classical computers. And uh, my colleagues Davide has already said that are quite good in factorizing uh, big number, also large prime number. And uh, you know, security in the, in the exchange of information is all, is all based on the difficulty of, of factorizing such big numbers. So my title, the title of my presentation already spoils uh, the problem uh, with quantum computers now. Because uh, if you think that uh, quantum computer will uh, arrive in, in 12 years, for example, okay, no worries, privacy is okay now. But there are a lot of attacks in, uh, from hackers that are called harvest attack. Then they just uh, take your data, take uh, encrypted data, perfectly secure data, store it in a bigger drive, and then I will try to open it uh, in 12 years. Uh, for example, just to provide you some information, um, banks' data must be kept secret for ten, uh, ten years. Also, uh, speeds, um, speed, the provider identity digitale, must keep your data secret for twelve years. So, twelve years, uh, you must uh, sta start to be scared now about the coming of quantum computers. So, what we can do to try to prevent uh, this this problem because it's a very big problem. But let's try to understand why this is a problem. I don't know if, you, if uh, any of you is aware of public key cryptography system, that is the traditional uh, informa information security system that we are using now. So just to remark, we have two uh, person that tries, that tries to communicate, that wants to communicate se securely, that are called, as usually, Alice and Bob. So the, this is... I don't know why they use Alice and Bob, but they just use it, uh, so we will use it. So, uh, to have um, Alice for communicating security with Bob must create uh, two keys. One that is public, and will, it will be sent to Bob, and one that is private, that Alice must be kept, as the name suggests, uh, private. The public and the private key are connected by an algorithm. That could be, for example, in RSA, you have that the uh, public key is just the multiplication of two big prime number. So the multiplication of two prime number is quite easy to be solved and a classic computer can do it, but while the factorization problem, so from the starting number retrieving the two uh, numbers, uh, the two initial number is quite hard. So then Bob has to use, has to encrypt the information that want to send to Alice using Alice's public key. Then Alice, having his private key, can easily decrypt the information. Okay, the same uh, can be done from the point of view of Bob. El Bob create a public key as his private key and then decrypt the information. All the, the security of all this stuff resolve um, is based on the exponential time. If my computer take an exponential time to solve the problem, I can just take a very large um, prime number, a very large another prime number, multiply it, and, and I have a problem that is quite impossible to solve with. Uh, classical computers. The fact is, in quantum computing, for the already quantum speed up that David has introduced to you, the fact is that uh, for factorization problem, the time is polynomial. So you cannot just uh, enlarging the key, the size of the key. This is just, uh, okay, 
the hacker must take uh, one more month to decrypt your information. So this is a problem. And uh, so um, can we so, uh, can solve uh, uh, other crypto problem uh, than uh, the RSA? Uh, at, the um, at the moment, uh, only a few are, are really safe to be considered safe uh, from quant the quantum computing threats. But uh, uh, this is also a future problem because we don't have the um, amount of qubit necessary to implement uh, such factorizing problem. The fact is that uh, um, the time is passing. This is the quantum roadmap from uh, IBM that is available on, on its website. Uh, on its website, you see, I don't. Um, the number of qubits is not visible, but this is 27. This is 1,000, this is 4,000, and then they are promising by the um, 2025, like uh, uh, 100 uh, of thousands of qubit. So you know, the increasing of the number of qubit uh, is starting to really speed up. So we need to be prepared to the arriving of uh, um, real, uh, real um, computer that tries to implement such factorizing algorithm. And uh, just to say to you, do you think that uh, any company, especially Chinese or American company, start to scream, okay, we have a computer that can break uh, privacy? Yeah, you must trust uh, on them uh, in order to do this. So, how, what are our options at this point? But the one is that uh, it's called post-quantum cryptography, just uh, find the problems that are difficult to be solved, even for a quantum computer. This is an, uh, just an example of an elliptic curve algorithm that uh, for, now, for now it is think to be secure against quantum computer. Other stuff uh, is using quantum physics uh, to beat quantum physics. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, my area of research of interest is uh, this stuff. I'm not really an expert on this, but uh, I try to give you um, a, a sort of um, comparison between the two. So let's start between with post-quantum cryptography. But, um, the pro of these techniques is that uh, it's, uh, it's easily deployed because it's software. You just don't need to implement uh, any, har any strange hardware, but you just need to use the correct software, and uh, the implementation cost is cheap. Yes, you just need to upload another software. The cons is our security. Since it's an, it's an algorithm, it's always based on assumption. So you must assume that, your quant that there does not exist a quantum algorithm or even a classical algorithm that can solve your, your, your algorithm. Your, your, sorry. <laughs> Throw me a word, uh, too many, oh, I say many, too many times the word algorithm. So uh, also based on assumption. And then the implementation also could be demanding because uh, um, Let's say, is at some point you need to, for example, uh, take uh, 10 times uh, um, lo a longer key with respect to the initial one. Then you need a 10 times uh, bigger memory. And this is not so easy to um, deal if you, if you work with uh, also old device. So this, this kind of uh, upgrade is not straightforward. With quantum cryptography, and especially with quantum key distribution, we have uh, the security because the security is due to quantum mechanics. And so it's mathematically proven that uh, our uh, stuff is secure. Uh, our vision of the world must be, um, how to say, must be incorrect to um, violate, the, uh, violate the, um, this type of security. It is demanding because, as you see, this device uh, is, a is a quantum cryptography device uh, and it's a dedicated software. You have to implement this device uh, on your hardware to have uh, quantum cryptography. Um, sorry, this is a pro in the sense that uh, your device is optimized for the quantum key uh, distribution, so it cannot be, it has not to be up updated during time. Deployment hardware, because this is an hardware and you have to upgrade it on your device. The cost, the, um, the other cons is the cost. It is quite expensive. One of these, that is uh, one, uh, one device that have to be, that have to be um, taken by from Alice, cost uh, like a thousand of euros. So it's something a little bit demanding now. Okay, but how quantum key distribution work? But let's start from, uh, let's start, and uh, we will analyze also only this protocol. This is the BB84, uh, that is the first protocol of quantum key distribution that we uh, was proposed by Bennett and Bresser in 1984. So the aim is all, is all we have is two party, also, Alice and Bob, that want to 
create a key that you use to communicate. And uh, contrary to the case of uh, classical uh, cryptography, the key is not transmitted. You don't transmit any part of the key, any part of the public key, any part of the private key. You don't have a private and a public key. So we need, firstly, a quantum channel. The quantum channel could be, for example, an optical fiber, if your uh, qubits are the photons, or even uh, the air. We have uh, some example of uh, QKD performed by, uh, from satellites, for example, or even from uh, different buildings that are connecting by fiber optics. And, there are, and, um, and there are just, uh, they are just using the typical fiber that the team use for your internet. So having our quantum channel, then we need, uh, in some way, a sort of um, qubit representation. We need to represent our information. And uh, in the BB84, one of possible way is the polarization, okay? So the polarization of the photon is just uh, the way of the electric field that is, uh, os that is oscillating. So if the electric field or oscillate vertically, this is labeled vertical polarization. If uh, oscillate horizontally, it's called horizontal polarization. And then we, uh, we need also uh, diagonal polarization and anti-diagonal polarization, okay? Then helis, that in, in our example is the sender, uh, must essentially encode its information in the polarization. So if helis send one photon with uh, vertical polarization or diagonal polarization, it's intend, it send the bit zero. If helis send one photon in the, horizontal um, in the horizontal direction and in the anti-diagonal polarization, it's intended bits one. It depends on in which basis we are essentially, repro um, we are essentially uh, representing our information. So, uh, Helis can send any one of this, of this uh, possible state of polarization from the photon. Bomb, Bob, from his side, has only instead two uh, is measurement instruments that are able to detect vertical and horizontal polarization, and this, this one is a sort of filter that uh, selects these two polarization, and uh, this filter that does the same for diagonal and anti-diagonal, okay? Then the um, transmission start. So Alice starts to send single photon with a specific polarization. It must be ensured that Alice chose, choose, um, Alice chooses his basis and the digit in a random way. In the sense that, uh, for example, it takes uh, one uh, random number generator, they say, okay, it uh, give the outcome B1. Okay, Alice say, Alice select uh, base one, and then uh, the random generator another run and say one, okay. So Alice is sending one photon with horizontal polarization, okay. Alice has, has also uh, the necessity of sending real single photon, um, real single photon. And at the moment, uh, um, source of single photon are not available. We have only probabilistic source of single photon in the sense that uh, sometimes they send us a real single photon, sometimes no, but uh, okay, this is the better that we can achieve now. Bob then must perform their, their measurement. This is our filter. Sorry for uh, the graphics. <laughs> it's the best representation to keep in mind. And uh, he must uh, choose the measurement, uh, um, the measurement orientation also by random, by a random digit. So Bob has its, also has its uh, random number generator and um, decide to measure in one direction or in the other in a random way. Okay, let's see why the protocol works. Okay, if uh, Helis has sent um, a photon with vertical polarization, and Bob decide to measure in the vertical horizontal basis, then the photon collapse exactly in the uh, vertical polarization. So Bob, the probability of having a photon in the vertical polarization is one. The uh, result is deterministic. The problem comes when Bob <laughs> chooses a different, the, another basis with respect to Alice. If Bob, if Bob to um, choose the other basis to the measurement, then the result become probabilistic. And since photon cannot be, cannot be split, a vertical horizontal photons just uh, collapse randomly on the diagonal and anti-diagonal with an equal, pro in, an equal probability. 
It's just quantum mechanics because uh, you see the vertical does not fit this, this sort of uh, basis, fit the others. And so a photon that comes here can equally collapse in that, in that, situ in that direction or in this one. So then the protocol starts. For every single photon, Bob and Alice uh, decide a basis, decide the digits, and then they start to, they start to, um, let's see what happens, essentially. So when the base of Alice is the same as the base of Bob, the result is deterministic. You see, Alice have the same digit of Bob. When the bases are different, the result become probabilistic. And so you don't know what's uh, happened here. Could be a zero, could be a one, no one knows. But then, uh, sorry, I go in the other direction. And so they, at the end of having accumulated a lot of statistics of this measurement, they perform what it's called announcement of the basis. So Alice and Bob, through the public channel, that is just um, the normal classical channel, just announce uh, their basis, their basis, the choice of their basis. So they don't announce the key, they just announce the basis. And they decide to keep only the terms, and only the rounds in which they select the same basis. So in the case, befo in the case before, they have, uh, they have selected only this one. And you see, the alic digits are the same of Bob results. And so in this way, they are creating the same key that could be used for uh, encryption. The nice stuff comes when uh, a third person, that is called Eve, tries to attack the channel. The fact is that uh, um, a particular and the most uh, naive uh, idea to attack the channel is to Eve uh, to play the role of Bob. So essentially, Eve cut the, um, the fiber, uh, the, um, uh, fiber and then put in the middle the, during the transmission. And Eve start to perform the same uh, attacks, uh, the same operation of Bob. So he's trying to measure the photon, essentially. But uh, what happened? If Eve chooses the, the right basis of Alice, since uh, he, um, Eve doesn't know uh, from the start which basis uh, was chosen by Alice, because Alice chose it, it randomly. So, okay, so if uh, the uh, guessing of Eve is correct, then the result of Eve is deterministic. Uh, okay, without this, uh, we can't work, uh, this protocol cannot work, because also the result uh, of Bob cannot be deterministic if the result uh, of Eve is not deterministic in the case. But then, if Eve chooses the wrong basis, uh, then he has the same probability of uh, sending the right photon to Bob or sending a different photon, okay? So at this point comes the magic. If Eve uh, um, interferes in the communication, you see, you have the appearance of some error, simply to statistics because Eve doesn't know what bases are using Alice and Bob, which type of the two bases. So statistically, in a long transmission, it starts to introducing error. So, after the announcement of the basis, Alice and Bob perform the error estimation. So they just uh, sacrifice a piece of the key and uh, they compare it, uh, um, trying to estimate it, its error. Its error. So in the case uh, of before, if they compare this sequence of key, they say that uh, this three value um, have an error, okay? With respect to the, to the perfect situation. So then, if the error are under a certain threshold, and um, I must admit that all the errors are, um, are treated as due to Eve, in the sense that uh, if your device is faulty, you cannot uh, really be sure that your device is faulty because uh, it's faulty or Eve, Eve is controlling it. With security, you want the maximum amount of security in your, in your transmission. So if the error is under a certain threshold, and this threshold value is just defined by the protocol. So for the BB84, I think that is the 11%, if I remember correctly. So you can say that your key is secure, okay? If the error are greater than, 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 than this threshold error, you must abort. Eve could be present and Eve could know about your key. 
So this is another incredible stuff with uh, QKD, quantum cryptography, with respect to classical cryptography. You can spot the presence of an adversary, which is quite uh, huge in this sense. Uh, you know that his adversary is trying to, is trying to cheat you. So how to use this key? But then we use one time pad. That is a method that is 100% secure. Let's say that uh, Alice won't say the letter B, he codifies it in binary, then he takes it, the key. You know, the key must be equal, otherwise uh, the protocol can't work. And they just uh, sum up, uh, binary sum, the two um, the, the letters and the key. And we have codified the letter B with the character hashtag. Then the hashtag is sent to the public channel. And if Bob sum up the same key, he can retrieve the initial letter. You know, the knowledge of the key is fundamental, but uh, this, is also, this is good because if, uh, for example, Eve have a different key, it just codifies another letter. So with the same, with, with, um, without the correct key, you cannot really find the correct, correct message. You can obtain any letters. So having a totally different message with respect to the original one. So you can say to me, why we, ca we can just uh, use one key and with one time pad, for example, I generate one key one time and use it to encrypt all the message. No, you cannot because uh, you see, if you sum two times the key, uh, the, key the key cancel out. So if you send one message codified by this key and you send another message codified with the same key, if you take the two codified message, the two encrypted message, and you sum up, you just take the superimposition of the two. So you need to generate a new key every time you need to send another message. And this is quite uh, good for security, but th this is also the um, limits of QKD because you need a key as long as the message that you want to send. For example, just to say to you, Video, a video conference, megabyte. Uh, the maximum achievable rate now is one, mega, mega, one megabit of generation with this QKD system. And I remark uh, the cost, uh, thousands of euros for one megabit of production of the key. Okay, so let's try to remark something about quantum key distribution. It is secure forever. It is theoretically the most secure approach that can be implemented, okay? From theory, we must uh, have um, something wrong uh, in quantum mechanics uh, if uh, this is not uh, secure. The attacks are unfeasible. So uh, in the sense that uh, in the previous attack, we have seen that if I've cut the fiber, just put in the middle, try to measure it, okay, just send a phishing email to Alice and Bob, control the system and try to scam it. So uh, the, you know, um, the, the, the fact is different now. With public cryptography, you have a, a vulnerability that is inside uh, your method of, ex of exchanging the key. Here you have a way in which uh, Eve can be in the middle and can do nothing, and you also spot it. Or spot it, she or him or it, whoever. And then uh, we hopefully have a cost reduction of quantum key distribution over time, because uh, as a research proceed, we obtain better um, instrument, better uh, also implementation, and the cost of QKD will decrease to arrive to something feasible. Because you know, uh, thousands of euros are nothing for a bank, uh, nothing for my governments, nothing for military also, but are, are uh, money for normal people. So you cannot uh, try to use it uh, in real life uh, till now. Okay, just to give you some speculative uh, information on what we do in uh, the Department of Physics of the university. This is one integrated chip in which we have implementing a new prototype of a bidirectional QKD system. So e Alice have one of these, and Bob in the other part have one other of these. Here we are injecting the light in this part. We are just using this structure to create the vertical and horizontal polarization and the diagonal and anti-diagonal. And with this one, we are trying to reduce the production key of uh, the, the production cost of a QKD system. This is just uh, another aim of uh, a startup that we are trying to found in the next future. Spe Spe that's a <laughs> it's also a nice uh, <laughs> thing for the event. And uh, we are essentially trying to implement uh, a chip 
but still secure uh, system for QKD, but could be affordable with uh, respect to traditional device. If you want to find out something more, just send an email and uh, I will uh, gladly answer to you. And uh, then I <laughs> want to <laughs> answer to your question. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Whoa. Thank you, Nicola, for your presentation. Uh, we've got a couple of questions and more are coming, and I guess a bunch of them will be coming to you directly yeah. in the, over the night. First one, do you believe there could be a way of using quantum entanglement so that there would be not a need for a cryptography for communication? Yes, there are quite uh, fancy proposals about, uh, about quantum entanglement network, but uh, in my opinion are a little bit unfeasible now, in the sense you, you, ha you must have uh, something that is uh, entangled with thousands of particles and then the entanglement propagates during the network. Uh, entanglement is quite, uh, how to say, uh, is, can be easily destroyed. So for now we must rely on QKD. Okay. Um, I had this very question during the talk, and I was like, but what if Eve intercept the exchange of bases of Alice and Bob? No problem at all. Okay. Because uh, the exchange of the bases, uh, it just, um, you don't need, you, you don't have the result of the measurement. Okay. Knowing the bases, uh, you just need, you know that Alice uh, have sent something in the in vertical or horizontal, and then Bob measuring something in the vertical or in the horizontal. And the exchange of the basis must be done at the end of the protocol, not during the protocol. So, okay, so that's, that's for so <laughs> during the protocol. It's difficult to backtrack, yeah. Uh, how do you test against uh, attacks in the choice of the 11% threshold? How can an intrinsically statistic tool be 100% sure? 100% uh, ah. difficult, difficult. Okay. but uh, <laughs> you know from statistics that at some point uh, you just need to sacrifice a slider, liar, uh, sorry, a larger amount of key in order to achieve to a security of epsilon like uh, minus 36 uh, or minus 30. So if uh, can reasonably be con attack of if could be reasonably considered secure in this sense. So it's just statistics. Uh, so at the end, achieving a lot of trial, you spot it. Okay, and uh, how can Alice and Bob use a key to encrypt things if up to 11% of the bits are different at that point? Yeah, there are, um, there are um, yeah, at that point, yes, you, uh, you must use classical techniques uh, to rec recover the key. In the sense that uh, a lot of uh, sin signal processing for example, uh, um, error correction that is done classically for correcting signal uh, in fiber opticals or in telecommunication has to be done in order to ensure that the, Q, the two key are really the same. So you need to correct. Okay, final question. Um, can you confirm that QKD feasibility does not depend on the development of quantum computers, but just on the ability of preparing a quantum state? It has photons. Yes, uh, but the fact is that uh, also quantum computer relies on the ability of uh, producing uh, the, certain, uh, the certain state that we want to use. So uh, the ability of preparing the correct state uh, is a, a common piece of the puzzle both for QKD and both for quantum computing. Okay, thank you. Thanks uh, Nicola Leone again for your talk. Uh, Warm applause. <laughs> Okay, so it's a, uh, hold on, what are you doing? Yeah, wait a sec, wait a sec. No, no, no. Let, me, let me go through a couple of things first. Okay, this one is right. Okay, just to tell you a few things before wrapping up. So, we told you, it's gonna be a packed month in October, 21st of October, the next track. 14th, 21st, 28th of October, we're gonna have the events with the grannies. Um, our next event is already out, it's on the 16th. Uh, so basically between the 14th and 16th, there's gonna be plenty of events. Uh, and it's gonna be about uh, LLMs. Uh, so we know it's gonna be a hot topic and we're gonna have uh, uh, 
you could say one of a speaker from one of the top two companies in the world um, doing LLMs. So it's going to be quite big, we tell you. No spoiler for now, but it's going to be in a, in a month. Just save the date for now. Tickets will come uh, very late. Um, final remarks for the night. Um, thanks for being here. There is going to be a lot of beers very soon in this very room. Uh, just to tell you, don't take it home because we pay the, a deposit fee on the beers. So just leave the bottles here if they're empty, especially if they're empty. If, you, if they're full, uh, just uh, drink them. Um, so please return them. And um, the final remark before closing the night, uh, um, this is like a very easy documentation to let you know how we're going to clean up all this mess uh, of chairs. Uh, so there's going to be some green chairs. You stack them and uh, you will, these ones here in the first floor, you will take them inside here in the ripostiglio. Um, there's going to be some orange and black ones. We take them to the entrance. Uh, the big, big, very heavy ones there at the at back of the room, we bring them on a side. And the final ones, we stack them. We get rid of all this mess uh, real soon. And there's going to be drinks uh, and food for everyone. Please remember, if you want to leave a donation for Spec and Tech, that's how we survive. And we see each other in October because it's going to be very packed. Thanks a lot. <laughs>